two. Christina, can you call the roll, please? Joe Zach. David McDowell? Yes. Here. Virginia Canlis? Here. Sherry Tindall? Here. Anthony Germina? Here. Let's vote right. Okay. Um, we're going to move one of the reports up real quick. Uh, finance and administration. Thank you for that. Um, can everybody hear me fine? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm here on behalf of Cindy, who is currently on vacation. Um, we are here to present uh, the May financials. Um, not really sure if you have any specific questions about any specific lines. Have you had time to review? Um, uh, it looks like there are some lines where we're hitting target. There are some that we're not necessarily um, but if you have any specific questions, I can take those right now. A couple of questions. Sure. First, I saw that cost of supplies went up for everybody. I would imagine that's inflationary pressure that you're seeing there. Um, are you anticipating that that will affect your capital projects? I would say yes. Um, but I would also defer this to the three directors here. You're seeing the cost, we're seeing the cost rise up based on the requisitions that we see come through. Um, but specifically, what are you seeing? Just about, uh, for IPL particularly, just about every project that we're sending out is coming out 20, 30, 40% over the, uh, the original estimate. Uh, in some cases, even more than that. We've had some projects where the bids came back double what the estimate was, and then we've kind of stood with the wagons and, and gone back to the drawing board. But uh, yes, the, the supply costs and labor costs both are hitting us uh, very significantly. It, and I would echo exactly what Jim said, I, but I would add to it is the other part is you may have like a pipe project and they won't be able to get pipe for eight months. So we're having delays in the project. So what we're gonna be seeing, not only does, will it affect our capital, yes, but will it also affect the timing of the capital? These projects probably won't get done, hopefully this year, but possibly in the next year. So just a heads up on that. Yeah, I saw a big change in your capital outlays from what you projected to what you've done. So that was my other question. Okay. Um, again, we're seeing a, a very common 30% on average increase in all of our projects um, that is on the utility side um, if you want to branch all the way out into even the street side overlay we budgeted 2.6 million and the uh, actual bid came in at 4.9 million so um, in when you we did the line item evaluation of that one it was across the board a 30 percent increase over just prices so we're seeing that and the delays we have a jones road culvert that's failed um, and threatening to take an entire lane of the street with it. It's already taken part and we can't get a concrete box for eight weeks. Wow. It's insane and painful. So yeah, like Dan said, just getting projects completed and we've got the contractor that's already been approved by council and still it will be fall before it's remedied because we can't get a concrete box. Okay. Thank you. Those are all depressing reports. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But it's happening everywhere. It's not just us. Anybody else have any specific questions about the financials? One thing I will say is I know everybody, or not everybody, but some people are looking for the June financials. It's not out there yet. It's currently being worked on. Our deadline, because it's year end, is uh, July 25th. I want to give you an idea. It is going to be very preliminary. There are some things that we are still waiting for to um, record. Those things haven't come in yet. We're still waiting for different invoices, things like that to come in. So um, what you'll see July 25th uh, is very preliminary and it's unaudited numbers. And we will end the year in the black. Um, that's the hope, but I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else? I have a question. Sure. So I've attended or watched on 
the broadcast, some mm -hmm. city council meetings, and um, there are occasional offhanded comments, whether it's a citizen speaking or even some of the council me members sometimes. And they refer to, I think it's IPL specific, um, cash reserves and that it's being whittled away and this type of statement. I think the debate, the candidate debate the other night included this. Um, it makes me wonder if we need a really simplified version so that people who want to make a statement about these financials actually has something they can understand quickly um, because I just hear really somebody says one thing and then somebody says the exact opposite and both of them think they're right and they don't have anything to stand on. So I don't know what we can do about it, but this is, you know, this is probably more complex than some of them can quickly interpret, but um, I wish the people understood a little bit more clearly what was going on. So. So is the request to maybe have an explanation a day where we can explain what exactly is um, all this different risk reserve? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I can break that back. I'll have to take your call later. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our presentation. The IPL refunding transaction summary. And just to clarify, that is a refunding, not a refunding, just so that nobody listening gets confused. This is about changing our. Um, bonding, not about giving a refund to anyone. Yes, <laughs> not a rebate or refunding. There we go. Hey folks, you have Chris Lover and PFM on, and I'm just checking to see if A, you can hear me, and B, if you can see the screen in front of you or if you're looking at the slides. Yeah, we can hear you. That's okay. a yes, that's a yes to both. We can hear you, and we see the screen. Okay. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be with you today and to talk through the refunding, um, refunding bond transaction that IPL completed. They did refund two series of prior bonds, the 2012 A's and the 2012 F's, and you guys did achieve, um, let's call it about $7.7 .7 million in cash flow savings. And on a present value basis, um, it was about $6.7 million. So um, it was a, a solid transaction in what I will say is a difficult market. And we were able to do a few interesting things. And on uh, this slide here, you can see um, historically IPL has maintained a debt service reserve fund. And this was a lot of cash, in this sense, about $9 million. And for the past few years, it sat around and hasn't really earned much interest income. And a trend that PFM had seen is that uh, bondholders didn't really care that much about having a debt service reserve fund to support the bonds. Um, so we conducted kind of an assessment with the rating agency, Standard & Poor's. We basically determined we could release this $9 million into the transaction, and that lowers the amount you borrow and boosts your savings up. So it was, it was nice, and it didn't impact your, your ratings. Um, so you did have an affirmation of your rating at the A level, and that was a new analyst, which is always a little interesting because they might not understand the nuances of IPL. So that's another good news story. Um, this transaction priced back in late April, and uh, again, it was a uh, war in Ukraine. It was a lot of Fed Federal Reserve speak, and there was a lot of turmoil in, in the markets. Um, so. We had to do some things to uh, kind of on the fly in a sense. So we procured what they call bond insurance. Um, that attracted more investors. Uh, we had to make a couple of restructures of the transaction to, to be able to get it finalized and finally sold. And compared to other utilities that priced that day, um, you guys priced a little bit better, meaning uh, lower yields on the debt. And in all, there's a savings levels um, that you can see here. Our, 
Our next slide talks to the general timing. And again, uh, that red late logo in the center of the slide there, that's who provided the bond insurance. And what that means is if, if there's a default by IPL, uh, they would step in and, and pay off their bond holders. Um, because of that, the transaction um, and it was insured at that double A minus level, so uh, a little bit higher rating. So that, that helped bring um, some more investors in, which was nice. And again, we were able to release this debt service reserve fund, which lowered your borrowing by about $9 million. So this is as if you're refinancing your house and you had an extra $5,000 lying around and you put that into uh, paying off your old mortgage. So you just borrow less and reduce your payments a little bit more. So you're taking you know, cash out of your one bank account and paying off your liabilities with it. Um, we did have a decent response our market. So the city has a bond link page, which uh, posted this transaction. Um, we also put out what they call the official statement or preliminary official statement, um, just like a prospectus for your, your 401ks, a lot of information and a lot of time and effort to put that together on behalf of the city. And overall, we had a bunch of very big names take a look at this transaction. Uh, names like BlackRock, which is very involved in the bond market, and then more household names like you know, Wells Fargo and Citibank and American Century. Um, in terms of the market conditions, you know, there was all this discussion about the Federal Reserve raising rates. And um, what I'd like to point you to here is that bottom arrow, and you can see the percent of time rates have been lower. And the blue box highlights the maturities of our funding transaction. And as you can see, across all maturities, the rates have been lower only you know, less than half the time. So it's still a decent time to get in the market and achieve refunding savings. Um, so this is the actual structure and kind of the results of a quarter period. And this is, is what I mean by a choppy day in the market. There was all this talk about inflation. Uh, Chairman Powell talked about raising interest rates. The Ukraine was kind of a newer phenomenon, hasn't was still on the front page of our newspapers. And instances of China going back into lockdown and supply chain issues. So there are instances, uh, if you look on the right hand side, the, the highlights in green indicate that at the end of our order period, our investors um, had bought four of the maturities, and the ones with the red, red numbers on the right hand side. Well, there are these holes where you don't have any orders or the, they were much less than what we expected. Um, and again, I think uh, in all, $26 million of holes that had to be filled spent about a third of the transaction. So we had to do basically some surgery um, on it to try to get it to over the finish line and over the goal line. So working with uh, the city as well as the lead bank on this, which is Morgan Stanley, um, we basically had to make these adjustments. So for some of these maturities, we had to increase the yield on them, meaning widen the spread out. And then we had to restructure those last three maturities in what we call a term bond. And with that, we were able to get uh, most of those holds filled, meaning about $24 million of additional orders came in. And Morgan Stanley did underwrite, uh, meaning they took $2.2 million of these IPL bonds into their own bank accounts, basically. Um, so they basically made this, uh, these adjustments. The transaction was done, and we were able to lock in the savings um, on that day as opposed to waiting and trying to, to reprice it the next day and the like. So in all, uh, we thought a very fair offer by Morgan Stanley to, to do this type of restructure and to underwrite. And, and it's, um, we have our pricing group, um, which participates in you know, our transactions, the PFM does coast to coast, and uh, they help to monitor the process. And, it, you know, I felt that these were fair adjustments to make. Chris, may I ask um, a question? Yes. How unusual is it for Morgan Stanley to underwrite in order to get the transaction to go through? Well, some banks do it in a sense that we want to just close the transaction and move on. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some banks and other banks won't do it at all. For example, we've come to transactions where we have a similar result at the end of this order period. And then the bank will say, we're not going to underwrite unless you guys pay us an extra, what we call a risk premium. 
So we'll underwrite we'll we'll underwrite your twenty six million dollars, but we want an extra half a million dollars to do and add it to our fee. Um, we see other banks that won't even do that, and they'll just say, you know, let's increase these adjustments by plus ten basis points or twenty basis points, and let's go back out into the market and see if these investors then pick them up with no guarantee that it'll actually happen. So in all, that's why we thought Morgan Stanley did a very nice job for IPO in the city by saying we're just going to underwrite, and then they'll basically sell these bonds out over time into to other investors or through their what we call their retail outlets. You know, if they have a wealth management practice, and you might go in there as your, you know, they're your wealth manager, and they would say, you know, why do you buy these IPL bonds? They're a great deal, and they're secure, and it's municipal, and it's tax exempt. So it's a nice, it's a very nice outcome, and something you don't see all the time. Did they charge us a risk premium? They did not. Fabulous. Thank you. I have no other questions. I'll go to, you know, here's the final investors again, kind of the who's who, the kid and stick with the transaction, you know, good hands, people, all state, uh, Wells Fargo. Um, and then here's the debt service statements. Um, I'll point you to the right hand column. Well, actually, I'll point you to the left hand column where it's its prior debt service. Um, so we had $127 million in uh, debt service you know, prior for the prior bonds. The refunding debt services at 102 million, and, and on the right hand side, you can see you know, the savings pattern here. Um, I will point out there's a red number, a red number here and there. Um, so, for example, in 2035, and that's um, I think we can, we can explain that in two manners. Um, we are trying to balance these two different series we were funded, the 2012 A's and the F's, and our software package looks across holistically to figure out how do we optimize savings across this entire 15-year um, period. So that's one reason. And the second item, um, the second red number there is due to the, 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 the kind of the, the practice that exists in our bond community of, of looking at that debt service reserve as basically funds on hand. So it lowers that $14 million um, to about, uh, you know, about that. Uh, $4 million, and that's why you see this the savings. But again, we've calculated that the actual result of the release of the debt service reserve fund you know, basically gave you an extra three to $400,000 in savings a year over the, the time the time period here from 2022 20, to 37. And essentially, in summary, um, you know, releasing $9 million, again, that helped lower the par amount that you borrowed, just like uh, putting cash into a refinancing of your house. Um, we did affirm your ratings with the new analyst, which is great. And um, we were, the city was very responsive in making some quick decisions that were provided by Morgan Stanley and PFM on how to make sure this transaction was done and finalized and done fairly for the utility, the city, and its rate payers. Um, we did save uh, $7.7 .7 million on cash flow basis. And we're looking at the next refunding transaction. Um, it's actually about a year from now for the water system. It's a little bit smaller, about $16.7 million. Um, so let's hope market conditions hold and we can often think of some other creative solutions to try to get some savings for the water system for customers. And that essentially concludes our, our presentation on the, the refunding. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. Does anybody have any questions? Hearing none. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Our next item, we have an action item, IPL, revised electric service policy. Mr. Nail. Yes, sir. Um, our electric service policy is, um, the policy is approved by ordinance. Uh, so in order to make any updates to it or changes, it has to go through that process as well. Uh, there's an extensive list of changes that are in your packet there, and much of it is simply cleaning up the language, removing some excess verbiage that really doesn't add anything to the particular item. Um, many of the changes are to take out um, sort of descriptive language about uh, what kind of requirements they have to have for various projects, and instead we replace that with Essentially, they have to meet the current NEC code, National Electric Code. 
That way, every time NEC changes, we don't have to go back and make another adjustment to the policy. We just state they need to hire a contractor and they need to meet the NEC requirements. So the, there are a couple of those significant changes that I wanted to point out to you. Um, in one of them, um, we have a practice of providing uh, temporary power uh, whenever requested and we don't charge anything for it. Um, unfortunately, uh, those assemblies obviously cost money and time to build them, to prepare them, to buy the parts. And when they get run over at the construction site or they disappear from the construction site, we don't recover, we, in the past, we have not recovered that cost. My, my recommendation to council is we stop doing that um, and make that as part of their the expectation on the builder, the contractor, is that they set it up. We'll come in and hook a meter up for them and provide the electricity, but they need to provide that infrastructure. It gives them incentive to take care of it. Uh, the other, another change is um, we provide. We historically we have provided the meter base that our meters plug into. Um, those meter bases cost anywhere from maybe forty or fifty dollars a piece to hundreds of dollars a piece. Uh, and again, uh, we've had a practice, we don't, not only do we provide the box, we actually have an employee deliver it to the site. Um, most utilities, are, the expectation is whoever is the contractor that's putting that electrical system together, they have a list of what the appropriate boxes are and based on the design that they have approved, they go to the local electric supply company, purchase the right box. Um, now there are differences between like Kansas City Power and Light standards and our standards, but any approved contractor and in independence would have access to the list of approved uh, equipment. They go down to the electric supply shop, purchase that as part of their as part of their part of the project. And then when we come and we make sure that all the inspections are correct and that it's done correctly, we would then plug our meter into their base, which is attached to their facility, of course. That's the, in a nutshell, that's the, the, main, the main changes that we're proposing. Like I said, a lot of this is just uh, simply cleaning up language, removing some redundant uh, language and then uh, specifying that they meet code rather than us trying to describe what it is. Okay. Um, so I guess we would need a motion to uh, approve this to go forward to the city council. May we ask questions? Oh, you? yeah, okay. sure. Any um, questions? First, whoever writes your stuff does a really nice job. It's readable. It makes sense to even people who are well done. Our planning, our, our planning engineering supervisor is Jerry Borland is here, and uh, he was he was responsible for the team that helped put this together. Okay, well, hats off, Jerry. Um, so this is a change in the way people do business in independents who are may have worked with us for a long time, and it's different. How does that get communicated to contractors and developers? Usually what we would do is give a kind of a pamphlet, brochure, send out, and make sure everybody's totally aware as it is passed by council, so they're, um, um, well, I would say aware of it. But we also, it, we've got some stuff, we probably transitioned into it, but it, we try to have a lot of conversation with them, send out mailers or some other way of communicating it. And we do have the website we could take advantage of to make sure we put the highlights out there so they'd be very aware of it also. Yeah, we can certainly work with Meg to make sure that there is a, a, a media uh, announcement that these changes are here. We also have planning meetings as part of the as part of the application process when when somebody is proposing to make changes to their facility or to construct a new facility. There are planning meetings that are that go on with all with the, all the utilities as well as the city. Uh, community development group, and uh, we would also have a, an opportunity to communicate that to our licensed contractors in the area. And then this has nothing to do with your changes. They were just questions that arose as I read the documents. I would assume all new development requires underground placement of lines. Typically, yes. Um, what will happen is we will, we will get electricity to the edge of the property 
and then from there throughout their development uh, they would be responsible for putting in the the underground vaults and and doing the conduit uh, for us to then put our cable through um, that is that's typically how new development is done okay so in here it said if you have overhead lines you have the option to have them put underground is that at the business person's expense or at IPL's expense if a if if someone is going to upgrade their service, change their service, um, that getting from their getting from their house or their building to our transformer, that's at their expense. Okay. Um, now we have we have um, there, and it's all it's always been in in the document, but um, it, there is a provision in there that says if you're going to do these changes, you have to go underground. Um, it does say at the IPL director's discretion. So we have been recently one because our manpower is is strapped and it's hard to get contractors as well. And for some of our residents, um, requiring them to move underground would be an extraordinary expense. And uh, in reality, there's not a good reason for it other than they made a change in their house. It may have shifted where the box is and just because of that, they would have to go underground. In some cases, I've seen pictures of yards that um, you're talking you know, 20, 30, 40 feet of obvious rock that they would have to bore through. To, and if there's no trees threatening the line, uh, we are willing to work with the, the resident to, to take those kind of things into account. That's good to hear. Um, there was also a section in miscellaneous that talked about code generation and is that just like the hospital obviously has to have a special generator in case things go out, or does that also address um, solar? Because I didn't see solar talked about in here at all. If if a res if a building has whether that's uh, solar panels or um, a, a emergency chip, your battery might be going. <laughs> If a, if a structure has, uh, whether that's solar panels or a backup generator or some other means of uh, generating electricity, we do have requirements of how that can be hooked up. It cannot backfeed into our system. Um, it has to be designed such that uh, if, if they lose power, when our, when our technicians come up to the house to try to work on the system, they're not going to get surprised by voltage that they're not aware of. Uh, so we do, there are requirements that speak to that in there uh, as far as cogeneration. And uh, what, again, that would apply whether it's solar or a backup generator or even a battery pack. Okay. Thank you. Did I say that right, Jerry? Yes. Any other questions? I have a little question. Sure. Go ahead. Jim, when um, you were talking about the box, or I think it's called socket for the meter, um, I think about why that uh, system was in place in the first place as far as IPL providing that. And I think, I bet people were getting the wrong one and then your tech would come out and not be able to fit the meter in. And so, you know, that's the only thing I would worry about with, you know, removing control of buying that item uh, over to the contractors, but you know, it's, I mean, it's a risk either way. You're either buying stuff and then of course providing manpower to drive it over, um, or you're taking the chance that they could get the wrong one and you get delayed. Well, and that's one of the reasons why part of the permit process, that permit must be pulled by an independence licensed contractor. Mm -hmm. It can't just be, you know, your nephew happens to know a little bit about do, doing some wiring. So he does it for you. That doesn't work. They've got to have a licensed contractor, and the licensed contractors uh, should know the code. Very good. Any other questions? That's it. Okay. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve. Recommend to council. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We'll have a vote. David McDowell? Yes. Bridget McCandless? Yes. Sherry Tindall? Yes. Anthony Jimita? Yes. All right. That brings us to our reports. Um, municipal services. 
I don't have anything formal to report today, but I did want to give you an update just on a um, something from last budget year that's um, we we started a new crew at sewer maintenance division and just got an update on it that I thought was really cool today. So just kind of wanted to pass it along. Um, we started a two man crew and they're an SSES crew, which stands for sanitary sewer evaluation survey. And their job is to go out into the system and find as many sources of I and I, which is inflow and infiltration into the system that they can find and stop it. The purpose of that was to um, basically stop us from paying to treat rainwater, which effectively, that's not, there we go, um, which effectively, the more, um, when it storms and that water does infiltrate into our system, we're treating water that isn't sewage and doesn't require that level of treatment, right? So trying to keep that out of there to keep our costs down. Um, they've just finished up their first area and are now working in Kentucky Hills where we have known basement flooding and rain events. Um, they found over 100 manholes to work on and started work orders to rebuild those and shore them up. Um, and they're actually able to uh, provide, uh, to quantify how much water we're keeping out of that system via our SCADA system at the plant. Um, this spring, for the first time, we had zero known flooding uh, basement flooding events in Kentucky Hills. So just proof that proof of concept and that that crew is one, very busy, and two, being very productive in helping um, just be responsible with uh, ratepayers' dollars and um, shoring up our system at every opportunity. So they're doing good work and I was just excited, so I wanted to pass it along. That's fantastic. Okay, water. Like Lisa, I don't have a formal report. I did send out a lead and copper uh, memo that I hope all of you received. And I didn't know if you had any questions. I'd try to answer those. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? No, good stuff. I, I just want to commend you. The memo was excellent. Uh, I think everybody in the country is kind of thinking about lead in different ways, uh, and it was a really helpful way to explain why this is not a concern for us. Uh, I know that the EPA put out ruling that we have to be sure we map all of our lead service lines and you address that in there that we have a few unknowns but you've got a plan for that um, so we should be in compliance so that's wonderful thank you you're very welcome so yeah but she was mentioning by october 16th we have to share our plan but in the meantime these 5300 service lines that we are unknown because we don't own the service lines, so it's kind of hard we're just going out and potholing them basically uncovering them, finding out what they are, and ho hopefully narrow that 5,300 down before that date so that when we come out with the final report, we could turn in that they're unknown, but it would be nice to know as many as we can just to relay, relieve anybody's fears. The other good news is that we've never tested. I mean, every time we test, we've not had lead in a service line in somebody's home. So uh, it's slightly depositing, as the memo mentioned. So I just thought I would make sure and drive that home that there, we don't believe we're going to have an issue. That doesn't mean that we're not looking at the issue. We'll have to respond back to the EPA like we're doing. So, yeah, so I thought I'd share that. Also, uh, I just checked and it is hot out. We're doing, I think, 36, 37 million gallons a day, which we have much more capacity to handle in the type of usage that we're having. So, but it is, it's creeping up and people are starting to, have to water things that they haven't been watering. They don't want their yards going completely dead, maybe dormant, but you know. So anyway, uh, just kind of, we're selling a lot of water. Well, that's good. Um, IPL. I just want to echo what Dan said about the hot weather. Uh, yes, it does. People are running their air conditioning, but um, our, our historic all time peak was uh, two, uh, was 315 uh, megawatts, and even in this heat wave, we've only peaked in the 260s. So whether that's a matter of uh, people are conserving, uh, people have gotten much more efficient appliances and siding and windows since the we hit that peak years ago. Uh, but right now we are we're well within our our capability of, of being able to meet work with Southwest Power Pool. Southwest Power Pool is setting. Uh, some all-time records for hourly energy delivered, but again, they are they're managing the entire region, the generation assets and the transmission assets to uh, make sure that they're that they have. They refer to it as resource adequacy, 
and uh, they're they're especially coming off of our our uh, February winter storm event. Um, they're monitoring that m very closely and making sure that the resources are there and available. And uh, so far, they have not had occasion to uh, issue any kind of emergency alerts, energy alerts. Um, it, the system is working well so far. Um, I did want to update you on a couple of things. We we have gotten our, our the generator that was under repair for H5, the generator's back, and the, the initial testing on that is good. However, the other end of the machine, the turbine end of the machine, there's a vibration um, that is, as they start up, that vibration's not going away. So our people and working with GE, we're looking to try to identify and isolate what the source of that is and then uh, determine a, a course of action in order to remove it. I, I mean, it could be something very simple or it could be something not. And uh, until we can uh, actually get in and, and review and, and investigate, we won't know. But um, the vibration is not going away on, on successive attempts. So it is something we, we have. When, it's, when something's spinning at uh, you know, that kind of speed, a little bit of vibration is a bad thing. So we're being very, very cautious on that. Uh, also, H6 is currently out of service at the moment. It appears that we may have had a, a lightning strike that hit the where that all connects into the system. Uh, several years ago, we had a similar event at another substation, and the, the damage looks very much the same. Some leads burned, some transformers that were damaged. Um, right now, it doesn't appear that there was any damage back to the generator, uh, but until we can start that up and do some more um, checks on it we'll, to verify, we'll, we'll, again, we'll be very cautious in, in making sure we identify any, any issues that were there. But it looks like it looks like all the protective relays and the protective designs did their job and, and isolated it before it got to, uh, into other other areas. Do you have an idea of when when you might know for sure? Not yet. I mean, we're still we're still investigating the looking at the different pieces of that system and, and making sure what you know, identifying what the scope of the damages are. And now one of the issues that we're going to run into is, again, supply chain uh, transformers. And depending on what size transformers uh, have, can have uh, even more than a year delivery. Um, some of them we can get right away. Some of them we can't. Uh, so we'll we'll work with our supply folks and, and our engineering team to try to make that analysis and, and get a report out as soon as we can. Uh, we are on schedule to make a appearance at the study session. Um, they haven't had the pleasure of us for a while now, but uh, IPL is going to be back at a study session. And one of the things we're going to be uh, talking to the, the council about is um, Southwest Power Pool. And again, this goes back to our February event and uh, Southwest Power Pool and other other agencies have done a very deep dive study into what happened, how it happened, why it happened. And some of the things that they're looking at is what I referred to earlier as resource adequacy, um, making sure that we have enough power on standby, ready to go, that um, when they need it, it's there, they can, they can count on it. Um, for many years, we've had that 112% requirement. Southwest Power Pool is recommending that that be increased to 115%. Um, the folks at SPP want to do it all at once. The member committee and several other groups that have reviewed this, they've recommended a 13% like next year, 14, and then 15, do it 1% uh, at a time. Uh, as it goes through the governing body, we'll, we'll see where it ends up. But uh, right now, it does look like there will be an increase in that, that resource reserve that we're required to maintain. Um, the other change they're looking at is how they credit capacity to a unit. Uh, for many, many years, essentially, it's been whatever the design of the unit is. It's, it's, you have to verify with a performance check annually or every three years. You have to do a performance check to demonstrate you can still reach it. But that's typically where your uh, a credit is for that, that system. They're now looking at changing that to take into account performance. So if you have a unit that breaks down all the time, is it really available? If you have a unit that um, is out for months at a time because of various problems, 
And even if it's not related to that generator, if it's related to the rest of your system so that you're constantly shutting this thing down and putting it into forced outage, they're going to, they're looking at a method of doing a deduct off of what they give you credit for based on performance. So we don't know exactly how that's going to work. Um, I mean, what we would lobby for is if it's a major outage, like, like our H5 generator, I mean, that was a specific uh, fault. It takes a long time to fix, uh, but once it's, once it's put back in service and verified to be working correctly, I would expect we should, we should get full credit back for it. Whereas if you've got a unit that every time you turn around, something else is breaking, I, I can understand Southwest Power Pool would want to have a, a deduction for that. We're still waiting to hear exactly what uh, Southwest Power Pool is going to decide on that and what their formula is going to be. Um, but as we learn those things, we will communicate those with you as well. But the bottom line is it could increase the amount of capacity that we're required to maintain uh, on our system. Any questions? I have a question. Is Evergy part of the Southwest Power Pool? Yes, sir, they are. There's an article that I believe was out of a Kansas newspaper talking about how they were able to have a surplus and they gave a $80 credit per customer during that outage and everybody else, including us, didn't. How does that work? A lot of that depends on what, gener what generation resources you had running during that event, how much credit you got for those systems, um, how much transmission uh, you were, uh, how much of your own transmission was being used, and how how South, uh, how Southwest Power Pool uh, balanced those payments. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into what the revenue is from SPP and. Uh, I don't have the particulars of, of what Evergy's were. Evergy owns that uh, Wolf Creek nuclear plant, don't they? They're, they're part owners of it, yes. Okay. And they also own IATAN? IATAN. Okay. That's all. Evergy has, a lot of, Evergy has a lot of generation in their portfolio. Any other questions? So reading about the Grain Belt Express, and I know that the way that that got approved, um, in Missouri and with PSC was that they had to leave 50% of that energy in Missouri because of eminent domain for the transmission. Will that energy all be available for purchase for the SPP or is it allocated in some way? Tell me about that. Uh, most of the Grain Belt Express is outside of Southwest Power Pools territory. It, okay. It's in, uh, I believe, so, MISO, yeah. uh, the American uh, Independent. Uh, where it's, where it's where its attachment is going to be made, it's really east of Columbia, Missouri, okay. and that's in MISO's territory. So while it theoretically, I guess, could re relieve maybe some congestion on the east side of Kansas City and SPP, I don't know that there's going to be direct correlation to re reduction of our prices over here. I don't, I don't know that the study has been done well enough yet, but the, the point of it it wasn't even going to stop in Missouri, but right. now it is. But it's it's in the MISO territory. Okay. So there'd have to be a cross between the two organizations to agreement for that. Thank you. That makes sense. Any other questions? Okay. Hearing none. Um, that'll bring us to our upcoming items. We've got the IPL development of future generation ongoing updates, um, efficiency programs available to citizens, and then next month we'll have our annual officer elections for chair and vice chair. Uh, board member comments. Does any board member have any comments? Hearing none. Okay, our next meeting will be August 18th, 2022. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. We are adjourned. <laughs>